السلام علیکم و رحمۃ اللہ وبرکاتہ جزاک اللہ خیر کثیر فار کمنگ آف دس ایوننگ میں اللہ سبحان ریوارڈ یو فار یور کمنگ ہیئر اینڈ یور ایگرنیس ان شاء اللہ ٹو ٹو لرن اباؤٹ ہاؤ ٹو فیس ٹرائلس ان لائف بیکاز اٹ از اونلی دوز پیپل ہو ریئلی ٹیک دیئر لائف سیریسلی ہو وانٹ ٹو نو how to deal with problems easily also. So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward you for coming here and inshallah I pray that this session is of benefit to myself and also for every single person who has come here today inshallah. Nahmaduhu wa nusalli ala rasulihi al-kareem amma ba'd fa'a'udhu billahi minash shaytan al-rajim bismillahi al-rahman al-rahim rabbi shrah li sadri wa yassid li amri وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي اللهم اهد قلبي وسدد لساني وصل السخيمة قلبي So a couple of years ago my very dear mother who is also my teacher recommended that I should read a book and that book is called كيف تواجه الابتلاء How is it that you can face difficulties How is it that you can face trials And the moment I heard about this book, I made the intention to read it. And alhamdulillah, the moment I got my hands on that book, I never put it away. And I have to be honest, it took me about, it took me over a year actually to complete reading the book. Because it is such a book that once you start reading, you don't want to put it down. Because it is alhamdulillah of benefit to your daily life. When I started reading that book, I made the intention that I will definitely share this knowledge with others also. So I'm very, very grateful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that He has given me the chance today to, inshallah, summarize and present the main ideas in that book uh, to you today so that, inshallah, it is of benefit to you also. Now this book, كَيْفَ تُوَاجِهُ الْإِبْتِلَاءَ This book, basically the author mentions 43 ways of dealing with life's problems. Now, when I saw this book and I thought, I, and I looked at the number 43, I was amazed. Because generally, when you are going through some difficulty, what is it that you're told? Be patient. Have faith in Allah. Right? Which is also patience in a way. Right? So, basically, when we are dealing with life's problems, the maximum we can think about is just two or three or five ways of dealing with the problems. But this author has compiled 43 ways. Now today, inshallah, I don't think I'll be able to go over 43 ways. But as much as we can, inshallah, I would love to share that with you. Now, trials and difficulties, they are in reality a blessing. Because our Lord is who? Allah. And when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes Himself in the Qur'an, After telling us about his name Allah, the first description he gives of himself is which one? Bismillah, Rahman, Rahim. So when we think about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, our Lord, we know that he is merciful. And he's not just merciful, he is Ar-Rahman and Ar-Rahim. Now generally we understand Ar-Rahman is merciful and Ar-Rahim also as Merciful. Yes, there are differences between the names, but the very fact that merciful has two different names for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, what does that show to us? That He is very, very, very merciful. And this means that even the tests and the trials, the difficulties that He sends our way are what? They are also a mercy. And this is the reason why every single trial... No matter how hard it is, no matter how painful it is, no matter how long it is, for a believer, it will always be a blessing. Always. Why? Because a believer will look at trials with faith in Allah, who is merciful. And because of that, that trial, even though it may appear to be punishment, even though it may feel very painful, In reality, it will be a blessing, inshaAllah. Now, how is it that we can convert our trials and challenges into real blessings? This is something that we need to think about. Because aren't trials and difficulties a daily part of our lives? 
Are they? Are they? I think women know, understand that really well. Really well. Because I don't know about you, but for me at least, when I was younger, I used to think when I grow up, inshallah, things will be fine. I used to think, you know what? When I will turn 18, when I will get married, when I will move out, when I'll be a mom, when I'll be this and this and this, things will be good. They'll be in control. But what I realize is that as life goes on, difficulties and tests, they never go away. In fact, they only increase. They only intensify. They only get worse as life goes on. So this is something that we need to learn about. How is it that I can deal with life's problems properly so that I'm not miserable all the time? Because when difficulties are a part of life, If we're not taking them as blessings, they're going to make us unhappy. They're going to make us miserable. When you look at the Prophet ﷺ's life, when you look at his description that the Sahaba gave, what do we learn? He was the person whose face was like the full moon. What does that mean? He smiled a lot. But when you study the life of Rasulullah ﷺ, no matter which part of his life, what is it that you find? that he lived a very difficult life. He was born an orphan. His mother died, right? His grandfather died. And then he received prophethood. And then what happened? Life only became more and more difficult. I don't need to go into the details. You all know very well. But the fact that the Prophet ﷺ could smile, I mean, that's something amazing. So this is inshallah what we're going to be looking at today, that how is it that we can also smile through our daily problems? How is it that we can also be happy and be fine as things get difficult? Whether it's the change of weather, or it is somebody's mood you know, changing with us, or their behavior changing with us, or a new challenge at work, a new challenge at school, children acting up, whatever it may be. So how is it that we can also smile through our life's problems? Inshallah, this is the objective today. So the author, he writes that first of all, know that whatever happened is from Allah. It is by His will. It is by His decree. Meaning even if we have been pricked by a thorn. These days we don't generally get pricked by thorns. I think we get poked by our pins or maybe spoked by a fork or something like that, even if it is something as small as that, it has happened by whose will? The will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And having this faith that my Lord, He allowed it, this is the only reason why it happened, this is something that brings a lot of strength inside. In the Qur'an we learn, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that, مَا أَصَابَ مِن مُصِيبَةٍ إِلَّا بِإِذْنِ الله. There is no musiba, no disaster, no difficulty that hits, that strikes, except by the permission of Allah. So nothing big or small happens except by Allah's permission. وَمَن يُؤْمِن بِاللَّهِ يَهْدِ قَلْبَهِ And whoever believes in Allah, then Allah will guide his heart. Allah will guide his heart, meaning Allah will guide him in that situation how to relax and how to smile and how to be at peace. Now, when we look at our lives and we look at the lives of those around us, not just human beings, but the rest of the creation also that is around us, above us, around us, below us, in whatever way, what do we see? That hardships and trials are something that no one is spared of. No matter who you meet, no matter which person is it that we come across, any person, young or old, will they have problems of their own? Even a little child. You know, we think that, oh, babies are so lucky. I wish I could be a baby. No, you don't wish you you would be a baby. You really don't wish that. Because, I mean, a poor baby cannot even burp until somebody will actually pick the baby up and help the baby burp. I mean, look at that weakness. And look at that agony that poor little child is going through because of a burp that is stuck. Subhanallah. No one at all is spared of difficulties. Every single creature is tested. Look at the planet that we live in. We see that there are at least 30 million different kinds of animals and plants that exist on this planet. 
30 million kinds. Not number, it's the types, species. And everywhere you look, land or water, you look at living things going to extraordinary lengths in order to survive. Really, the struggle they go through in order to survive is just amazing. Now here, I would like to mention a few examples, just so that when we put it into perspective, our problems, they don't seem that bad to us. If you go to the underwater world, you look at a Pacific giant octopus. Now, a giant octopus, all right? A pretty strong creature. A female Pacific giant octopus will watch her eggs for six months. After it lays its eggs, she will watch her eggs for six months, not leaving even once for food. And what that means is that after six months, finally, when her eggs will hatch, she is starving. She will die. So when she goes to a safe place in order to lay eggs, basically, she's going to her grave. When you look at a tiny frog, a strawberry poison dart frog, it's as small as a fingernail. I want you to look at your nails. Okay? One nail, one fingernail. This is how tiny this little frog is. All right? Now this little frog will first watch and guard and protect her eggs in the water. But eventually what happens is that the water dries out. So then it has to run to different places and collect water from there in its mouth and bring it to where her eggs are. Finally, when the eggs hatch, the tadpoles come out. For sure, the water will finish. So then what it does is that it carries its babies, one tadpole at a time, on her back. This frog will carry her tadpole on her back and she will climb up tall trees, all right, all the way to the top, looking for a place between leaves where there's water. And any small hole place that she will find where there's water, she will go and put her tadpole over there. And she will do this for every single tadpole. Now, to put this into perspective, this is equivalent to a human being, all right, climbing the Empire State Building. Just imagine. Have you ever carried your baby on your back? Forget a baby. Have you ever carried your backpack? Have you backpack? Huh? If you have to climb stairs, does it get difficult? Yes. Extremely difficult. In the Arctic, you look at reindeer. Reindeer are constantly on the move. Why? In search of food. And they walk so much, constantly, constantly on the move, that by the time these animals die, the amount of distance they've covered on their foot is equivalent to walking around the earth three times. Three times. Now, I would go on and on and on. Right? Because when you look at nature, when you look at makhluq, when you look at Allah's khalq, when you look at any creature that exists on this planet, you see that life is tough. Life is difficult for every single creature. And we as human beings are not exempt from that. This is a universal law that people are going to be tested. We as human beings are going to be tested. In Surah Al-Ankabut, Ayah 1 to 3, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Alif Lam Mim, Ahasib al Nasu an Yutraku, an Yakulu Amanna, Wahum la Yuftanun. Do people think that they'll be left just because they have said, We believe and they will not be tested? They will be tested. Certainly they will be tested. They will go through hardships in their lives, for sure. This is Allah's promise. Because the moment you come to this world, you will be tested. This is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's promise. Allah says in Surah Fath, Ayah 3, Sunnat Allah illati qad khalat min qabl. This is Allah's sunnah. This is Allah's way, which has always been there. And you will never ever find for Allah's way a change. Meaning the universal laws are not going to change for us. Just because we're crying so much or just because we're upset or just because we're not accepting the difficulties that have become a part of our lives, this universal law is not going to change for us. So then what's the solution? What should we do? Can we escape life's problems? Can we? Can we avoid them? I mean, we can try to keep ourselves safe and that is something that we should do. But we will be caught. 
by difficulties. So when we realize that difficulties are a part of life, then for sure bearing those difficulties becomes easier. Let me give you an example. When you go to school, when you go to university, is it understood that you have to sit in class? Is it understood that you have to do your readings? Is it understood that you will have midterms? And you will have projects, and you will have assignments, and you will have exams, and the list goes on, doesn't it? When you go to work, is it expected that you will have to work? It's understood, otherwise it won't be work, right? So when you approach your work with this mindset that yes, I have to do such and such and such, then does it become easy? Yeah, because you've accepted it. So our biggest strength in facing life's problems after belief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is accepting the fact that yes, difficulties will be there. It's not going to be easy. Things are going to get tough. Another thing that helps us in dealing with life's problems is like what I mentioned earlier that nothing happens except by the will of Allah and nothing happens except by Allah's decree now in hadith we learned that the first thing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created the first thing that Allah created was the pen so we're talking about before dinosaurs okay before the earth before this universe the first thing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created was the pen. Before the angels. Before jinn. Was what? The pen. And Allah ordered the pen to write. And the pen said, what should I write? And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ordered the pen to write everything that is going to happen. Everything that is going to occur. So what does it mean then? That what has happened today that I have found very, very difficult and painful, was something that was written when? Yesterday? Last year? When I was born? When Adam a.s. was created? When the earth was created? No, even before that. It was written. When it was written, it was meant to be. And remember that this is the core of our faith. This is what distinguishes us from the rest of the people. This belief in Allah, that Allah knew it. Allah decided it. He allowed it. This was meant to happen. It was decreed. Ubadah bin Samit radiallahu anhu, he said to his son that, Oh my son, you will not taste the reality of faith until you know that what has come to you could not miss you. And that what has missed you could never have come to you. This is our faith. And once we understand this, that this was meant to be, this was written, then yes, we understand what faith is. Then yes, we have faith. Now, when you go to the airport to catch a flight, and it is on time, you board the plane, you find your seat, you sit down, you get all comfortable, and the flight is 14 hours nonstop. It's difficult, but will you have sabr? Will you have patience? Yeah, I mean, somehow you will spend those 14 hours. But if it so happens that you get to the airport and you find out that the flight has been delayed four hours, then what happens? Angry, right? Now, after four hours, you find out it's going to be another hour. Hmm? You say, this is my ticket. Okay, these days nobody takes printed tickets, but still you insist on taking it. So you take it anyway. All right, and he said, this is my ticket. It says the flight was supposed to depart at this time. It's been five hours. You get upset, right? What if you sit on the plane like it happened with me once, and then because of the storm, because of the snow, the plane cannot move for five hours or three hours or two hours, then what? You've lost it, basically. Sabr gets difficult, right? Now what if finally when the plane takes off, the flight was just two hours? Hmm? As opposed to that 14 hour flight. Now for that 14 hour flight, you had sabr, why? Because you knew that the flight is 14 hours, that's what the ticket says. Right? But when a two hour flight turns into a 14 hour journey, then what happens? Sabr becomes difficult. 
So what brings us patience is the fact that whatever is happening right now was written. It was written. I believe in that. And when it was written, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will help me go through this also because I have surrendered to His decree. Then sabr will come. In Surah Al-Anbiya, Ayah 23, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, لَا يُسْأَلُ عَمَّا يَفْعَلُوا وَهُمْ يُسْأَلُونَ Allah is not questioned about what He does, but they will be questioned. What does it mean? That whatever Allah decrees, whatever Allah decides, it does not deserve to be questioned. Allah's decree, His decision is so perfect, it is so sublime, that it doesn't even deserve to be questioned. Why? Because who is the decision maker? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So any trial, any difficulty that has come my way, big or small, it has happened with Allah's knowledge, His decision, and Allah's decisions are based on His wisdom, right? His perfect justice, and His perfect knowledge also. This is why, as a person who believes in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, am I going to wonder, why me, O Allah? Can I wonder? Can I ask about that? That, oh Allah, why this? Why this test? Why did this happen? Why did this person have to be taken away from me? Why did I have to suffer from such and such and such? The people of my age don't suffer from such a disease. Why am I suffering from this disease? I am still very young. Why? Will this happen then? No. Because Allah is not questioned about what He does. Why? Because He knows what He's doing. We don't even know about what's happening in our lives. Do we? Do we know about what's happening in our own bodies? We don't know. Do we know about how our children are thinking, what they're feeling? No. I mean, sometimes people are so close to us. They're visibly upset, but we don't even know what the reason is. Does it happen? All the time it happens. So the fact is that we are deficient in knowledge. Whereas Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not deficient in knowledge. He's perfect in His knowledge. Our justice, our standards of justice, what are they? They are deficient also. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He is absolutely just and fair. In Surah Kahf, Ayah 49, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَلَا يَظْلِمُ رَبُّكَ أَحَدًا Your Lord does not do injustice to anyone. Nobody at all. Nobody. I mean, sometimes we feel bad about someone who's struggling. Like for example, if there's a, you know, for example, a particular creature that is struggling, you want to interfere and you want to help out. But when we try to help out, we're not actually helping out. What are we doing? We're causing it harm. You know, for example, if there's a chick that's trying to come out of the egg, what do you want to do? You just want to break the shell for it. Right? Help it out. But if you do that, the chick won't survive. It has to go through that difficulty of trying to come out of the egg itself. It has to go through that in order to survive. I once learned about this particular fish that I don't remember now. Its name I don't remember. But this particular fish, they noticed that the fish that would eat it, another fish that would eat it, because of that predator, that this particular fish would have to, you know, swim a lot. All right? So what they did is that they got rid of the predators. All right. So in a particular place, they got rid of the predators. But then what happened, that this particular fish, its taste changed. All right, Its taste changed. It wasn't that good anymore. It wasn't that flavorful anymore. So then they figured out that because of the predator, this fish is constantly swimming, moving, moving, moving. Now that seems so sad. Poor fish. Let's you know take it out of the misery and just take the predator out. Right? Save it some trouble. But that affected the quality of the fish. So in order to improve the quality of the fish, they put that predator fish in the same tank. They put the predator in the same tank. Now, in our lives also, sometimes we see things that are very, very difficult to bear, very, very difficult to tolerate, very, very difficult to go through. But in them is good that we don't know about. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows. And this is the reason why He's put that difficulty in our lives. If it wasn't good for us, He would not have placed that difficulty in our lives at all. Because, وَلَا يَظْلِمُ رَبُّكَ 
Ahada, he does not wrong anyone at all. When you came here, did you find the dua card on your on your seat? You know, this dua is dua for relief from sadness. When you're feeling sad, what should you say? The Prophet ﷺ taught us this dua. And in this dua, what do we say? Allahumma inni abduka, ibn abdik, ibn amatik, nasiyati, biyadik, maadin fiya hukmuk, adlun fiya qadauk. That, oh Allah, whatever you decide concerning me will for sure happen. And whatever you decree concerning me is adl. It is pure justice. It's possible that I don't view it as just and fair, but Allah, you know. I trust your decision that it is fair. So this is what the Prophet ﷺ taught us. Adlun fiya qadauk. Now, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is putting us in some difficulty, what is the reason? What is the reason? What's the benefit? There are definitely benefits. What are they? Some of them are, firstly, we see that difficulties are an expiation for our sins and mistakes. If we don't suffer the consequences of our mistakes, would we ever fix them? Would we ever fix them? Let me give you an example. You have a disagreement with your husband. And in that disagreement, you say something that's disrespectful. Next thing you know, he's upset with you. And not just upset like he was last time. This time, he's really upset. So what happens? You're like, I'm sorry. And he's not happy still. And one day goes, and then another day goes. And then what do you think? What have I done? I better fix this. I better fix this. And then when you fix it, do you learn from your mistake? Now, if your husband didn't get upset with you for being disrespectful, would you care about being respectful with him next time? Or disrespectful with him next time? No. We won't, really. So when we see the consequences of our mistakes, yes, they are very, very difficult. But if we didn't see those consequences, would we fix ourselves? No, we wouldn't. So difficulties are meant to purify us. They are meant to remove our sins from us. They are meant to erase our mistakes. The Prophet ﷺ said, No Muslim is afflicted with harm because of sickness or some other inconvenience, but that Allah will remove his sins from him, just as a tree sheds its leaves. Now fall is coming very soon inshallah. And we will see a lot of trees that are full right now. We will see them empty. Literally empty. Right now you can barely see the branches. But what happens when fall comes or winter comes? What do you see? Not even a single leaf. So this is what happens. When a believer goes through difficulties in his life, then all his sins, they fall off. He is forgiven for the sins that he has been committing. In another hadith we learned the Prophet ﷺ said, No fatigue nor disease, nor sorrow, nor sadness, nor hurt, nor distress befalls a Muslim, even if it were the prick he receives from a thorn, but that Allah will expiate some of his sins for that. You know in the hadith what is mentioned earlier, that no fatigue nor disease. Hmm? Nasab, wasab. Nasab is, you know, when you get tired, when you've been working all day, do you feel tired? All right? Like maybe you've been working all day, getting your children ready for some classes or something, dropping them off, coming home, feeding them, cooking, and then cleaning, and then laundry. And then finally when you're sitting here, you're taking a deep breath. Huh? So this is fatigue, this is nasab. But even for this fatigue, what happens? A believer's sins are erased. How merciful is our Lord? Not just nasab, but also wasab. Wasab is constant pain. Constant pain. You know, for example, if a person has some disease, let's say a condition in their bones, because of that, they're constantly in pain. Even for that constant pain, the sins are being erased. In another hadith, we learn that once the Prophet ﷺ, he visited Um Sa'ib, a particular Sahabiya, and 
he said, what is the matter, Umm Sa'ib? Why are you shivering? Because she was shivering. She was so sick. She was shivering. So she said, I have fever. لا بارك الله فيها. May Allah not bless it. Meaning she was really upset with the fact that she had fever. She was saying, لا بارك الله فيها. So the Prophet ﷺ said, don't curse fever. Because it expiates the sin of the children of Adam in the way that a furnace removes dirt from iron. Furnace, really hot. But when you put iron in it, what will happen? That iron or whatever object it is, it will become purified. So yes, fever is not, I mean, it's not fun. It's no fun at all. You cannot even enjoy the food that you're eating. Isn't it so? You cannot even keep your eyes open and read anything. But there is still benefit in that. And what is that benefit? Our sins are erased inshaAllah. In another hadith we learn, trials will not cease afflicting the believing man and the believing woman in their self, meaning in their lives, in their children and wealth until they meet Allah without having any sin. Without having any sin left with them. So now, after listening to all of these ahadiths that I've mentioned to you, what do we learn from this? Any trial, any difficulty, how should we react? How should we respond? What should be our first reaction? What should it be? Frustration? Anger? Or something else? Okay. What would you call it? How would you describe it? Because, you know, we say, oh, patience. But what does patience mean? What does patience mean? How exactly is it going to happen? Go ahead. Recently, uh, a friend of mine, and I'm sharing the story because she actually wants me to, you know, share her story with others because, inshallah, it will be a source of inspiration. She was diagnosed with cancer. She has three little children. Three little children. The youngest is three. And um, when she was diagnosed with cancer, you can imagine for a young woman, it was a big shock. And when she called me, she was crying and crying and crying. And she was telling me about every other thing that she's gone through. And I said, I honestly don't know what to say to you. But anytime any worry comes into your mind, say, رَضِيتُ بِاللَّهِ رَبَّهِ رَضِيتُ بِاللَّهِ رَبَّهِ that, O oh Allah, I am pleased with you as my Lord. I don't understand why this has happened, but you have decreed it. This has happened by your will. You permitted it. You know my situation. You love me more than I love myself. You love my children more than I love them. رَضِيتُ بِاللَّهِ رَبَّهِ Recently, I spoke to her again after a couple of months where her treatment is going on. And she said that every time I get worried or any time I feel you know, scared for myself or for my family, for my children, I just say, رَضِيتُ بِاللَّهِ رَبَّهِ And I was so happy. Now she sounded so different. And she's a source of inspiration. When I was listening to her, I was crying. I felt like how impatient I am with the petty issues that I have, I face in my life. So one thing that we can say when disaster strikes, when difficulty strikes is, رَضِيتُ بِاللَّهِ رَبَّهِ I am pleased with Allah as my Lord. What else can we do? From these ahadith that you heard, what else can we do when we are struck with some difficulty? What can we think? What should we think? Yes. Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'un. Indeed, we belong to Allah and to Him is our return. This is a confession of the fact that, yes, Allah, you are my Lord, I'm your servant, I'm your slave. You know this dua? That, that inshallah you will receive or you have already received on this card. Allahumma inni abduk ibnu abdik. That, O oh Allah, I am your slave who is the son of your slave. Meaning, I am a slave. My nasab, my ancestry is also of who? Servants. Meaning, we are all servants to you. This is who I am. So, inna lillahi, this is a confession of the fact that, O oh Allah, I am your servant. I am your property. You can do whatever you want with me. Inna ilayhi rajirun. Oh Allah, we're coming back to you. To you is our return. Now, another thing that we need to remember is that suffering trials 
Suffering from difficulties is a proof of Allah's love for you. This is a proof of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's love for you. What do I mean by that? Tell me something. If your child comes and says, Mom, can I please eat this pack of sour patch? The whole pack. First thing in the morning before breakfast. What are you going to say? No. No. What is he going to say? Why? And then that why will turn into a tantrum, which might turn into a you know a full crying session. Right? Now the child, your son, is upset, sad, very, very sad, because you refused candy. Right? But why did you do that? Why did you say no to him? Why didn't you just give it to him? Don't you love your child? Don't you want him to be happy? Why did you say no? Because it's not good for the child. So what? Why? Why are you making that decision for him? Because you care about your child. You care about his teeth. You care about his health. You care about his nutrition. Isn't it? You care about his future. This is why you are depriving your own son of the very thing that he desperately wants and is crying for. And it's very painful for that child. But why do you do that? Every single day. Don't we experience this as mothers? Don't we? Or as older sisters? All the time. I mean, my son, he's only six years old now. He said to me, Mom, how come you don't allow me to do what I want to do? And I was thinking, you're only six. What's going to happen when you become a teenager? Right? But why do we do this? Because we love our children. Isn't it? We wake them up in the morning, even though they want to sleep. Why? Because they have to go to school. We force them to eat their breakfast because we love them. So sometimes in our lives, we are made to go through things that we don't like. Or things that we like are not given to us. Why? Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala hates us? Dislikes us? No, He cares about us. In a hadith, the Prophet ﷺ said that if Allah wants to do good to somebody, He afflicts him with trials. مَن يُرِدِ اللَّهُ بِهِ خَيْرًا يُصِيب مِنْهُ Allah puts him in difficulty. Why? So that Allah can reward him. So that Allah can reform him. So that the servant can correct himself. So that his sins may be erased. So that the servant can improve himself. So trials, difficulties, they're not meant to humiliate us. They're not meant to destroy us. They're meant to elevate us, make us stronger and better. In a hadith we learned the Prophet ﷺ said that a person has a position near Allah. Meaning Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants that a person should attain a specific level, a specific rank. Alright? But this person is not able to attain that level through his actions. He's weak. You know, for example, you set high goals for yourself. Ramadan just came and went. We set goals for ourselves. I have to read the whole Qur'an cover to cover, at least once, at least twice, at least three times. And by the end of Ramadan, you're sitting wondering, I barely managed to read half of the Qur'an. You set a goal for yourself, but you weren't able to accomplish it. Right? You tell yourself, I'm going to get up tonight and pray tahajjud. And what happens? You barely wake up in time to pray one with it. Right? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also has a certain rank for His servant. But a servant is not able to attain that rank just by his actions. So then what happens? The Prophet ﷺ said, So Allah continues to test him through what he dislikes until he attains that position. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will make that person go through difficulty upon difficulty upon difficulty. Why? So that because of his sabr, he can reach that high position that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has decided for him.